Happy to be here. So I'm uh, pleased to represent a very large team who have really made OSIRIS-REx come together. These are these kinds of missions. They take a huge number of people, a huge number of specializations, and many, many years to get here. So just to give you an overall sense of that, so the first time, or Canada's first uh, entry into this mission was in 2008 when the guys from University of Arizona gave me a call and said, hey, can you do a, an instrument for this mission? So I started working on this in 2008. We're now in 16. We get to Bennu in 18. Sample comes back in 2023. Um, these things are almost a career. So anyway, thanks for coming. And I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be able to share uh, some, some elements of what I think is a very important mission. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the mission in general. Um, and then a little short section on why we picked Bennu, this asteroid that, that the mission is going to, what's unique and, and why we care. And then a little bit more about OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter, which is my instrument and the instrument that the Canadian Space Agency is paying for, therefore you are all paying for. <laughs> all right, so OSIRIS-REx. So everything in space, it's an acronym. I remember the first time I started working in the space industry, I sat through a meeting and I did not understand a thing that went on because it was acronym after acronym. And there were acronyms within acronyms within acronyms. So it was very, very difficult. So OSIRIS-REx is an acronym. So it's really the, the objectives of our mission. So it's origins, spectral interpretation, resource identification, security, regolith explorer. So this is one of the first talks I've been able to give where I say, we launched. <laughs> so usually it's, we're going to launch in September 2016. Well, we launched in September, on September 8th, 2016. So we, we launched on this Atlas rocket. It's kind of, it was kind of an odd rocket. The, one of the ones in the 411 means it was one single solid rocket booster. So not a pretty rocket because it wasn't symmetrical. We had a nice symmetrical rocket with one booster hung on the side, so it's kind of an odd-looking thing. Um, so if these movies will play. So this gives you an idea of uh, how we get to Bennu and why it takes us from now till 2018. So we launch from the Earth, and then we play, like many of these missions, you know, it, it all has to do with getting there with the least amount of fuel or, or at least a manageable amount of fuel. So we almost catch up to Bennu, um, and then we don't. <laughs> <laughs> and then we do a close flyby of the Earth. And the reason we do this is to steal a little bit of the Earth's energy to, to execute a plane, plane change, which if we didn't, would take a lot of fuel. And then we, uh, then we start catching up to Bennu again. And in 2018, we'll, we'll get there. Might as well let it. Uh, might as well let it actually get there. All right. So, what are the science goals? So, the number one goal of this mission is to bring back a sample. So, you know, we we understand many of the things that we know about asteroids because we have meteorites, and we can often identify and tag a meteorite and say it's come from this type of asteroid. Well, we don't really have um, very many good samples of, of um, this type of asteroid, maybe none. And the other thing that happens is they're not pristine. So you know, a meteorite falls, it's affected by the Earth's atmosphere, it sits around, it gets affected by the Earth's environment. So it's really important to, to bring a sample back and get an idea of, of the pristine conditions, the conditions that the, the asteroid is, is made of you know, in, in situ. The rest of the goals really have to do with understanding more about the asteroid, where it is, and understanding context for the sample. So we're going to create all kinds of maps of this asteroid. Um, we're going to document the sample site. So one other thing that's important about going and grabbing a sample is you know where you, you get it from. You don't just say, oh, it might be this asteroid or it might be this class of asteroids. It's, that asteroid, and it's on this location on that asteroid. I'm going to talk about these in a little more detail. Um, we're going to spend um, a couple of years almost around the asteroid, so we're going to be able to understand its orbit very accurately, and, and this is important, and I'll explain why. 
And then we can't go to all the asteroids, so we're going to sit and we're going to look at with telescopes to some of the asteroids and having some um, ground truth, we call it, of what's actually there helps us to better understand the other asteroids because we can do comparisons between ones that we know very well and others that we have similar uh, results from ground-based or, or uh, space telescope-based observations. Okay, so the mission timeline. So we talked about this a little bit already, but in the fall of 2018, uh, we get close enough to where I start to really care about the mission because we start to turn on our instrument. We're going to stay uh, at Bennu for up to 505 days. I think you know it used to be closer to 300 and 505 was the, the stretch goal. I think we've, we've now moved to where 505 or something close to it is closer to the baseline, and, and that has to do with some limitations on grabbing the sample and how hot the sample will get before we can get it back to Earth. We're going to obtain, so the, the mission success criteria is to grab 60 grams of, of sample and bring it back. It doesn't sound like a lot, but 60 grams is actually a huge amount of sample. We would archive much of it, and then we would um, still be able to do all of the science we would like to do with the rest of the sample. Mm -hmm. Now, we would all be disappointed, although it would be a successful mission, and you know we would tick the box to NASA and the Canadian Space Agency and say, we were successful, we would all be disappointed if we only got 60 grams. We're actually um, hoping and expecting to get much closer to a kilogram or maybe even a little bit more. And then in 2023, we go pick this up in, uh, in Utah um, as it comes back to, to Earth in a return capsule. And then samples get delivered to Johnson Space um, Center for curation by NASA. And we're still actually working on the curation plans for Canada because this is our first time doing this. So the spacecraft, it's actually a very big spacecraft for this kind of mission. It's about two meters on each side. You know, the solar arrays are a, a little longer, uh, eight and a half square meters of, of solar arrays. Mm -hmm. um, the sample return capsule has a lot of heritage, so it was used on the Stardust mission. Um, this is not a good picture. I'll show you a better picture where you can get a sense of, of size. So here's the actual spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the large uh, dish on the right side, that's the high gain communications antenna. The smaller little uh, flying saucer-like thing on the left of the picture, that's the sample return capsule. And all the instruments are, are um, hanging around on that deck. Um, okay, This little thing here with the little red cap, that's the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter, or at least one of the two boxes of the laser altimeter. The other box is, is under the deck. Um, whenever you see red on a spacecraft, it usually isn't going to be there. At least we hope it's not there for flight. In this case, that's a, that's a cap on our on, on the aperture of the instrument, and we wouldn't really measure anything if it was actually launched that, like that. So uh, we'll trust it wasn't, and that's why we make things red. It's red removed before flight. Okay, so everything. Um, we would give up most of the science goals on this mission in order to get that sample back. So. Um, whenever you think about how this mission evolved, you have to think that that's the number one goal of the mission. Mm -hmm. um, so, 60 grams, as I said, is the is the uh, success criteria, and the re the way we get this is what's called with the touch and go sampler. So. We've been very careful in the development of this mission never to use the term landing. And the reason is that, you know, if you think about a Mars mission, you know, landing is always the sort of the exciting, read, risky part. And, um, you know, government agencies that are providing you funding, they, they actually, they want you to do cool stuff, but they actually don't want to hear about risk. So, um, yeah, it's kind of odd because usually cool stuff and risk go hand in hand. But nonetheless, that's uh, you have to play a little politics in getting these things going as well. So um, we call it touch and go. And 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 really, you know, although there is some risk here, uh, it is much more akin to a spacecraft docking. It's a very slow thing. So we just come into the uh, asteroid, we touch it for five, ten seconds, 
Um, we only push on it with about five newtons of force, so we're not going to be responsible for moving this into a Earth disaster kind of orbit. I get that question sometimes, so I thought I'd head it off. Um, and then we touch it with this uh, thing called the, the TAGSAM, so touch and go sampling mechanism really is all TAGSAM stands for. And if you like, it's a reverse vacuum cleaner. We can't put a vacuum cleaner because there's no air, so we have to bring our own air, and instead of sucking up the air, we, we blow it out. And, um, and then we capture the regolith in, in sample. There's kind of an annulus area of sample collection. So we require, you know, we, we're not going in and, you know, landing on a boulder and then drilling and bringing back a solid sample. We really need um, loose material, kind of an inch on down, and we'll suck up, if we get that, we'll, we'll suck up a kilogram or up to two would be the capacity here. So a kilogram in, in the testing that we've done both in the laboratory and we've done some um, microgravity testing in, in aircraft in the Vomit Comet, uh, we really think a kilogram is, uh, is a distinct probability. All right, so we had a little struggle with the sound, so you'll, you'll have to have my narration through this. Just a little video of, of the mission. So you can see the tag SAM is out here on this long arm. There we blow the nitrogen canisters. We get our material. It was a little sped up there for, for video. I think five or ten seconds, that whole thing. Um, takes. What the spacecraft do, is doing now is it's doing a, a, a nod, and the nod is to actually um, measure the moment of inertia of the spacecraft and figure out if we actually have 60 grams in that tag sam. So that's really our chance. If we don't have 60 grams, we're going to go down and do it again, and we can do it up to three times. If we have 60 grams, we're going to get out of Dodge and, and bring it home and, and not risk another uh, collection attempt. Mm. So then it gets stowed in the sample return capsule, comes back, the sample return capsule gets jettisoned and it lands in the UTTR, Utah Test and Tracking Range, I think it is, in, in, in Utah. That's where the Stardust capsule came down as well. So that's 2023, so um, 2008, and actually the people at University of Arizona have been working on this mission since long before 2008, and they proposed a similar mission um, in a previous NASA competition and weren't selected through to flight. So um, there are literally decades of, of work that have gone into this. <clears throat> okay, so we need to understand the surface of the asteroid for a couple of reasons. We talked about the sample. We, need to, we want to understand the context of the sample, you know, where exactly the sample comes from, what the what the, the uh, evolution of that area where the sample uh, came from might be. We also have some spacecraft safety uh, aspects. So we talked about TAGSAM wanting, needing loose material, regolith we call it. Um, there are also safety issues with respect to how much tilt that TAGSAM uh, sample head can take. And if it's too rough, then we won't get an efficient collection so the maps will be very important both from a scientific perspective, from a spacecraft safety perspective, and from an efficiency of sampling perspective. So these are, these are key. We're going to have spectral maps. Um, we have cameras, so we're going to have images. We've got our uh, laser altimeter and some camera-based ways to get some topography, so we'll have topographic maps. And then we have spectrometers, so we'll have elemental maps. And so all of these are covered by um, payload instruments. So this is a um, cartoon of the deck. So you can see we've got a camera suite here. This is done, um, I think I have some better pictures of it. And this is done by the University of Arizona. We've got um, REXIS, which is an X-ray spectrometer. It's actually a student project, so we don't, that's, it's not a, I was about to say a key part of the payload. It's a key part of the payload. We're all very excited about the science that can come, that will come back from this instrument. 
um, but it's not funded as part of the main mission. So we're not actually processing the data in the same way we are with the key instruments like OLA or OCAMS or the spectrometers. Um, but we're certainly uh, very pleased to have it on the mission, and it's a collaboration between MIT and, and um, Harvard. <coughs> We've got the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter. There's a couple of other uh, LIDARs um, here as well, and those are really just, they're tied tightly into the spacecraft navigation system for that final touch and go uh, maneuver. So the, in terms of all the mapping, uh, it's really our LIDAR that's the, uh, is the key. And then we've got the two spectrometers, OTES and OVIRS, and I'll talk about them on the next slide. So really our way to, to understand the, the mineralogy and the makeup um, and any distribution or, or diversity over the surface of the asteroid is with these two spectral instruments. So we've got um, a visible and near-infrared spectrometer called, called OVIRS. So it, captures the visible from about 400 nanometers out to the near mid-infrared out at four microns or so. And then we have a thermal spectrometer. Uh, so that's built by NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. We have, um, and it's this one, and then we have a thermal emission spectrometer. So that, that gets the thermal properties of the asteroid out to about 50 microns. I think the flight model will go a little beyond 50 microns. And that shares heritage. Those of you that are Mars aficionados, you've heard a lot of these test instruments. So there's orbital and ground-based uh, uh, thermal emission spectrometers, and that's built by um, Phil Christensen's group at, the, um, at Arizona State University. <clears throat> then we have our camera suite. So um, you know, the, the key camera from a science perspective is really this large camera called Polycam. Um, it's the, the narrow field of view telescope. We use that to actually pick up the asteroid when we're at a distance. We also use it um, to, to look at the finest scale of the regolith and particle size frequency distributions on the surface of the asteroid, trying to assess you know, whether we're going to have a successful collection. And then um, sample cam is really focused on uh, looking at the sampling uh, activity. And then MapCam is really a navigation camera. So we use this optical, these optical cameras to navigate the spacecraft uh, close by the, the asteroid. So these are all built at the University of Arizona, who are also the, um, that's the prime institution for this mission. So the principal investigator for the mission is at the University of Arizona. Oops. Okay, so. The other goal is documenting the sample site. So again, we want to do this from a spacecraft safety perspective and a sampling uh, efficiency success criteria perspective. And we'll do that with these spacecraft. Same if you think about a Mars mission, they always talk about a landing ellipse. You know, there's a significant uncertainty in where you can bring a spacecraft in um, to, to pinpoint landing. So pinpoint for Mars is some number of kilometers. Um, pinpoint for Bennu is some, some tens of meters. So we really have a 25 meter uncertainty. So we have to assess all of these maps, our, our probability of successful sampling in this 25 meter, it's closer to a circle for, for this mission than it is um, for an ellipse like a Mars mission. But that's where we're going to be spending our effort to try and get the, the highest fidelity information. Mm -hmm. OK, so measuring orbit deviations, why do we care? Well, this is the security aspect of OSIRIS-REx. So uh, OSIRIS-REx target is called Bennu. Bennu is a near-Earth asteroid. Um, that means that this asteroid, although it spends most of its time in an orbit that is um, greater in radius than the Earth's orbit, it does cross the Earth's orbit periodically, and it does have a probability of impacting us. Now, when we were actually selected, this was the number one hazardous asteroid that we knew of over the couple hundred years. I'm not 100% sure, because I've been so focused on this one, but I actually think it may have been overtaken by one or two. Um, you know, these are pretty small uh, probabilities. Uh, I think there should be a 
a number here. So the, you know, the cumulative probability over a couple hundred years here is, is a pretty small number, 3.7 times 10 to the minus 4. Very small number, so you know, we shouldn't keep ourselves up at night worrying about this. Um, but you know, the problem is that if one of these things ever hits that small probability, it's, it's potentially disastrous. Um, this is a relatively small asteroid. It's not a dinosaur killer, um, but that's a, a very large amount of energy, and it would be it would really be disastrous to um, to a large portion of the population if it, if it ended up hitting in the wrong place. So, you know, we're really the first generation to to have the ability to protect ourselves from these uh, potentially catastrophic events. So. Um, it is certainly a major goal to try and increase our knowledge and our ability to actually predict uh, the, the orbits over long durations so that we, we can you know, protect ourselves if, if necessary. So just an illustration here of the orbit. Um, so you can see here's the Earth's orbit, this uh, white ring. And so Bennu spends most of its time almost getting to Mars and a little bit of its time inside the Earth's orbit. So these are what we call Apollo asteroids, um, <coughs> and uh, they're, uh, they're worth worrying about. So you might think, oh, you know, our, our mass pretty good. You know, we understand um, the dynamics of objects in the solar system. You know, why do we struggle? Why, do we, why are we still getting probabilities over a couple hundred years? Why can't we make these things definitive and say, this is going to hit or this is not going to hit? Well, one of the reasons is um, and asteroids are small, and they get pushed around the solar system by lots of small forces. And this gives you an example of one of them. This is called the Yarkovsky effect. And, and characterizing this for Bennu is one of our major goals. So we're going to get some. Uh, positions of Bennu using radio science to get this position to the spacecraft, using our LIDAR to get this, the position of Bennu with respect to the spacecraft. So we'll have very, very accurate knowledge of Bennu's orbit over a year or more. <clears throat> well, Bennu is a rotating asteroid. So as it rotates and it's absorbing energy from the sun, and so this is the daylight part if we just look at this little part of Bennu. As it's rotating, this portion here rotates around and gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And then it gets into um, its night. And this portion in the night is hotter than this portion because it's cooled off as it continues to rotate. So there are more, there's more radiation because this part of the asteroid is hotter. There's more thermal radiation being emitted to space on that side of the asteroid than on this side. And that little force, you know, you can think about something like three grapes on the table, that's what we're talking about, is enough to, to make a difference over many, many years of our ability to predict where this asteroid's going to be. And so this is actually a complicated prediction to try and model this because it depends on the thermal properties of the asteroid, so things like packing density and heat capacity. It depends on the optical properties, how well it radiates, and it depends on the surface morphology of the asteroid because that depends on that. That makes a difference on directions that things um, radiate and and our ability to absorb, and it depends on our exact knowledge of the size of the of the asteroid. And even for one as well studied as this, and we spent a lot of time studying this because it's a target of this mission there are still some significant uncertainties associated with even its basic diameter, mean diameter. <clears throat> so this mission will give us the best modeling and prediction for any asteroid we have of this, this effect. And so beyond just trying to understand how this pushes the asteroid around that are already in, in near-Earth orbits, this is also thought to be an important effect on how these asteroids got to be near-Earth asteroids in the first place. So this is a histogram, so number of asteroids along the y-axis as a function of the semi-major axis of their orbits. So this is the asteroid belt. You know, we're out, out beyond Mars inside of Jupiter, so it's the asteroid belt. And you'll notice these, there are gaps. 
And each of these gaps where there are no asteroids represent resonances with Jupiter in particular. And so if an asteroid gets into one of these locations, they can, they can it's like a swing. You know, you, every push, every orbit, you get a little bit more energy. And it's thought that this mechanism of resonances can actually kick asteroids into these near-Earth um, orbits. And so how does this connect with Yarkovsky? Well, if you're an asteroid here and you're rotating, you can actually move in or out you know, your, your semi-major axis of your orbit can change over time and it can move you in to one of these resonances and then it can kick you out of the asteroid belt. So, um, you know, people that are trying to understand, you know, this process as well as trying to actually go backwards and say, okay, this near-Earth near asteroid, how did it get here? Um, and work the process backwards are very interested in this effect as well. Okay, and then comparing to telescope observations. So, you know, we as scientists would like to be able to go to the 500,000 plus asteroids individually with missions. Um, your, your tax returns would not like us to be able to do that. So, you know, we are going to be looking at all of these other asteroids with primarily ground-based optical telescopes or radio telescope observations. And every bit of information that we get about, you know, this observation with this ground-based telescope of Bennu says this, and Bennu is actually made of this material, improves our ability to make these inferences for other asteroids. So although we go to one asteroid, um, you know, we, we can really think about this mission uh, improving our knowledge of, of um, certainly classes of the carbonaceous asteroids. Okay, so how do we uh, classify these objects? So we've talked about one classification uh, already, which Bennu is one of these Apollo asteroids. So they have this kind of orbit, and there are other orbits you know, that are, that are out beyond um, Earth's orbit or, or spend most of their time inside of Earth's orbit that have other names. So Bennu is an Apollo asteroid. Mm -hmm. Spectral classification is maybe our most important. So there are, you know, three major classes of asteroids. There's the stony ones, so gray, lots of silicates usually. Um, there are the metallic asteroids, and then there are these ones like Bennu, which are carbonaceous, so lots of carbon, usually very dark objects. And then each of these have different flavors. So here, here are the S ones, here are the C ones. And so what these lines represent are, are um, spectra. So in, in this case, um, Bennu's got a slight blue slope, so as it gets to the shorter wavelengths, you get a little bit more reflectivity off it. Some other um, asteroids, you know, that they have certain, they have key spectral features. Um, you know, asteroids like Bennu are predominantly flat. They just have slight slopes to them. So sometimes this is, you know, all we really get about, hey, that asteroid is probably this type of asteroid. And, and there can be very large uncertainties on some of these observations. Bennu, in fact, I can show you some observations where uh, it looks flatter than blue slope. So even in different observation periods, and you know, believe the scientists' error bars, um, uncertainties on their measurements, we sometimes can't rationalize two different observations of Bennu. So we really don't know if that's because there's surface mobility, the, the material on the surface is moving around, or just one of those observations is wrong. Um, when we get there, I guess we'll find out. So Bennu is a carbonaceous asteroid, so part of this C type um, or C group, carbonaceous group, and it's a B type. Okay, so why did we uh, pick Bennu? This is all we know of Bennu in terms of its shape right now. So this is a radar model created by um, one of the uh, scientists on the mission, Mike Nolan. So this is primarily Arecibo, um, that big dish in the ground in, in Puerto Rico. 
Bennu is about a 500 meter uh, mean diameter object, so to put a scale to this. So if you're thinking about this in terms of dinosaur killers, you know, dinosaur killer is probably you know, 10 plus times this uh, diameter. Um, so it's, it's not a huge object, but it's big enough. It ha it's very dark. It looks like pick the blackest object in this room, and, and that's probably about what Bennu uh, would be like. So it's uh, very fun to try and think about bouncing photons off it to actually measure distance. It's not the most cooperative object. Um, it rotates about 4.3 hours in its day. This is about a seven meter um, shape model. And if you're interested in understanding the fidelity of this, one of the things you could do is go to the, one of the Japanese missions went to an asteroid called Itakawa. And you can find these kinds of models of Itakawa before the mission, and then you can find very accurate shapes that, that were derived after the mission, and you'll see we may get a few surprises, but it's roughly spherical, and there are, there's some equatorial bulging. Um, I wouldn't want to necessarily say too much more than that at this point. So why did we pick Bennu? So Bennu was formally known as 1999 RQ-36. It means it was discovered in 1999. Um, so we start really with you know, over 500,000 asteroids. So how do we get there? Well, 9,000 near-Earth asteroids. Why do we care about a near-Earth asteroid? Well, because we can sell the security aspect, because we can get there a little bit easier than, than getting out to the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. Then we try and bring that down a little further. We are worried about getting a sample back. So only 350 of these you know, have sort of reasonable um, orbits for, for bringing the sample back. I mean, you, you put a lot of fuel and a lot of time, you can get a sample back from anywhere, but we, we do have some monetary and many of us would like to have these samples back while we're still working. So there are some constraints. Then 29 of those have diameters greater than 200 meters. Why do we care? Well, we have to navigate around this space, the spacecraft around this asteroid. And if the asteroid's too small, then that gets to be even more challenging. Um, so we like to have a little bit of gravity. Um, five of those are carbonaceous. So, you know, these dark carbon asteroids are ones that are important from perspective of, uh, of the solar system formation. Really, these are snapshots of the early solar system. These carbonaceous asteroids have these things called uh, chondrules in them. They have these things called um, calcium aluminum inclusions. And these are really some of the first things that condensed in the early solar system. As well, um, we're trying to understand what kind of organic material uh, might have been available and, in, and you know, had impact on, on the Earth's evolution. We're trying to understand um, whether these asteroids were important in bringing water back to the Earth once it was um, driven off during the, during the um, bombardment of the Earth's surface. So these carbonaceous asteroids are really asteroids that we, we know less about and they're potentially the most important for understanding the Earth's history. So out of those five, um, we selected Bennu. Mm -hmm. So that it seems like 500,000 we should have no problem, but we actually get down pretty quickly to a much smaller number. Okay, I'd like to ex tell you a little bit about our instrument. We're, we're really excited about it. I should um, give a little bit of a nod to, to some of my colleagues. So um, we're kind of semi-divided, although the, the division is not maybe so uh, clean as it appears on paper. There are many of us working on both aspects of this. I, I'm certainly doing a lot of work on the, on the sample science and preparing for the sample science. But if you want an easy way to understand who's doing what, uh, this is it. So uh, there's myself at York, who's leading the, the team and the instrument. There's Katherine Johnson at UBC, who's the, the deputy instrument scientist. Uh, we have a couple of um, US um, collaborators, um, the most important being um, Olivier Barnouin at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And then the instrument is being built by uh, MDA in Brampton and, and Optech in, in Bonn. So these are the two companies that work together on the, the Phoenix Mars instruments as well. 
Then we have uh, Alan Hildebrand at University of Calgary, Ed Clutis at University of Winnipeg, and Becky Gant uh, here at the University of Toronto. Um, so Alan works uh, primarily on physical properties of asteroids. Uh, Ed Clutis, he's our Canadian um, planetary science spectroscopy expert. So he's Mr. Spectroscopy. And uh, Becky is working on dielectric properties of asteroids, trying to understand the interactions of these radar signals. And I showed you a shape model of the um, asteroid. So our ability to interpret that data is impacted by our ability to understand the, the dielectric properties and how the, the radar interacts with the asteroid. Okay, so what does OLA actually do? Well, um, OLA is really a key instrument for this mission. So um, we talked about the geological context for the sample. OLA supports that. Um, bulk properties of the asteroid. So we get mass from understanding the motion of, of the spacecraft. If you want to understand the density of the asteroid, which allows you to infer a lot of the internal makeup, then you need the shape and the volume, and we measure the shape and the volume. I'll tell you a little bit more about how OLA works. It strikes me that maybe some of you are not following um, because I didn't explain it very well what OLA actually does, but that'll become clear and we'll revisit these if, if needed. Um, and with OLA, we get the position information required to uh, assess the Yarkovsky effect. We also get the shape for the Yarkovsky effect. A lot of what we know about asteroid surface evolution has to do with understanding the, the shape, but also the distribution of uh, boulders and, and ponds of regolith, and OLA supports all of these. So what is OLA? OLA is a laser altimeter. So <clears throat> this is the thing that, that uh, catches you speeding on the road. So we send out a pulse of light. We time very accurately when we sent that pulse out, reflects off of something, comes back. The time difference gives us the round trip flight time, and from that we, and the speed of light, we can calculate a range. So that's... OLA in a nutshell. Um, OLA does this very well and with some key characteristics that are, that are important. Now, there's a little bit of history. So one of these, uh, so we talked about assessing risk on missions and how politicians don't like to assess risk, but they like you to do new things. So you have to propose this really cool instrument that does all these new things, but you have to say that, you know, there's no new development here, so all the risk is, there's no risk. So how did we do that in this case? Well, there were two previous missions. Um, there was this uh, US Air Force Research Lab mission called XSS-11. XSS is Experimental Spacecraft or Space Satellite, I guess. Um, and it had a scanning LIDAR, LIDAR that was built by MDA, and it was meant to scan you know, other objects in orbit for, for various purposes. Then there was the Phoenix LiDAR. So this is the one I had a bit to do with this mission. I had a lot to do with this mission. Um, so this was the LiDAR that we sent to Mars in 2007. And it actually, um, a great Canadian discovery, we found it snowing on the surface of Mars. So it seemed like an appropriate Canadian discovery. And the uh, laser transmitter uh, for this, although um, you can see it's green here, uh, OLA has an infrared one, so you can't see it. Um, the green one is derived from the infrared one, so we just had to remove a crystal. And that laser, almost identically, is uh, one of the two laser transmitters that are inside um, the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter. <clears throat> so this is what it looks like. So you saw this already on the spacecraft. You saw a red cover here on the, the aperture. Um, the aperture is so big for, the, the, for receiving the photons back, um, there's a little beam, one of two beams. We have two laser transmitters that come out near the center of this. So all the optics in the lasers and uh, some of the temperature control is in here. The, over here, it's power, uh, a command and control computer, and anything that we didn't need to put inside the, the optical head. So this sits on top of the deck. This sits under the deck. A little bit more detail, here are the two uh, lasers. So we have a high energy laser. The high energy laser operates at 100 pulses per second. So we get 100 range measurements every second. It starts out beyond seven kilometers from Bennu. Um, it's, it has something like 0.7 millijoules of energy for those of you that 
care about millijoules. Um, then we have this uh, low energy laser, and the low energy laser is actually the most important of the two from my perspective because it's going to get us all this fine detail on the surface of Bennu. That operates at 10,000 measurements per second. So every second we get 10,000 range measurements to Bennu. It's, it's orders of magnitude higher than, than other LIDARs that have been operating around planets. And we can do this really because we're operating so close to the surface. Um, this is not the flight model, but it's essentially equivalent to the flight model. So this is one of the prototypes, engineering model that was built. Um, one of the key things is this big mirror. So if, if you, so looking right into the screen, uh, above this mirror would be that, that exit aperture or entrance aperture that I showed you. So the photons come in, they bounce off this mirror, they bounce off this mirror, and then they get detected by a detector over here. Well, this scanning mirror can move in two axes. And so th this is one of the most unique things um, about OLA. If you think about other laser rangefinders that have orbited the Earth or orbited Mars or, or um, the Moon, or they, they're, it's a very different regime. They're operating the orbital velocities. We measure those in kilometers per second. Around Bennu, we measure in sort of centimeters per second. So you can think 10 or 20 centimeters. So if we had this laser rangefinder and we were moving at this kind of rate above Ola and we were measuring 10,000 points per second, we would have a lot of information about very little of Bennu. So this scanning mirror really allows us to take that very high measurement rate and optimize it and cover the whole asteroid in a very short amount of time. So how do we do that? So here's our little cartoon of Bennu. Um, here's some different uh, mission phases. They're really, these are typical names we use to divide the mission. The mission kind of starts slowly, you know, far away and gets to know the asteroid a little bit and then it moves a little closer in and then a little closer in. And each of these uh, uh, moving a little closer in is a distinct mission phase and, and really has a distinct distance from the asteroid and a distinct observation mode. So our furthest one, we're normally seven kilometers or so away from the surface of the asteroid. This is the preliminary survey phase. We, I'm going to try and do this with my laser pointer. So the spacecraft, say, moves across the surface of the asteroid, and OLA scans like this. So we get a very sparse scan across the asteroid, and that helps us to, to refine our spacecraft navigation. It helps us to understand some of the shape models of the asteroid that we'll already have derived using camera-based techniques. Mm. Then we move a little closer in, and actually we've, used to be we got to five kilometers uh, first, and then one kilometer after. It turned out the, the navigation team was much more comfortable with going in a little closer in an orbital phase, rather than this uh, phase at five and some more stations at three and a half kilometers where they have to do a lot more active navigation because they're trying to essentially hover over a surface uh, position on the asteroid. So we go right from this distance down to this pseudo orbit at one kilometer. And I'm showing no, the baseline is uh, Ola is not operating. Um, this is not going to happen. We're going to be operating. We're going to be operating at our 100 measurements per second. Um, we're going to be prioritizing very much the polar observations, which uh, we don't get very well with other methods. And we're just in the process of sucking the, these operations into the baseline mission plan. So decisions get made in a very um, uh, methodical way on these missions. Detailed survey phase. Um, we try and stay over a portion of the asteroid. The asteroid rotates underneath us in 4.3 hours. The spacecraft nods up and down and Ola moves back and forth. And we get these very dense swaths of the asteroid that way that we can piece together and make shapes. But our key uh, observation periods are these orbital phase B. Um, this is really the place where we can turn on that high energy or low energy laser that gets 10,000 measurements per second and we're going to blanket this asteroid with a billion measurements. So we're essentially going to get spots, you know, next to spots, something like that over the whole asteroid. So um, this may be our 
best characterized solar system body in the entire solar system when we're done. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you a little bit more about how we do that if I have time. And then this reconnaissance phase is the phase where we're looking mostly at that little 25 meter sampling site. We're going to do this over a few sites to try and pick the safest one. And this is a little more complicated. So the spacecraft's moving. The spacecraft is slewing back and forth like this. And Ola is moving its mirror like this. So it gets very, very dense, lots of overlapping spots. And we're going to try and get resolution of Ola. So our spots will be say, three centimeters. And we're going to have overlapping ones. So we would expect to be able to um, get topographic information at below um, the three centimeter spot size in this phase. And that will help us maintain our spacecraft safety, understand where our sample came from. <clears throat> so a little bit of um, what uh, some, some real data from, from OLA. So those of you that our York people will, un will recognize this. So this is the physical plant smokestack at York. And there's a student residence in behind. So what the students don't know won't hurt them. Um, this is what these buildings look like with the actual uh, OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter that, um, that is on its way to Bennu. So you can get an idea. So all of these spots here, these are actually atmospheric returns. So we won't get many of those around Bennu. But you can get an idea of you know, the power of, of this. So we're talking about, about 900 meters to the physical plant stack and closer to 1,200 meters um, to the student residence. So it's a long way away. We get pretty high resolution. So when we first took this, you know, we noted this little uh, spot here on the physical uh, stack. So I sent one of my students out to say, hey, what is that? Um, so what it is are some security is a security camera, and you can see that uh, you know from that distance we we get a pretty good uh, characterization. Remembering this is not you know a solid block. This is something that has some morphology to it that's that's actually smaller than than our spot size at this distance. We actually get pretty nice data out there. So you can imagine this being the sur surface of an asteroid, and it's going to be uh, pretty cool and really unprecedented. So in orbital phase B, we're going to get all of these um, sort of three-dimensional images of the asteroid. This is a nominal kind of size that we'll get in that phase. And we're going to piece all of these things together. And one of the cool things about OLA is we can do that without much understanding of the spacecraft position. We need a little bit of knowledge um, of the rotational velocity because it distorts our images a little bit. We need a little bit of knowledge of the spacecraft um, motion because that distorts our images a little bit. But unlike other methods, we don't need to situate the exact position of the spacecraft and we don't need to feed that data into creating this shape. So we get a very independent um, shape of the asteroid um, unlike any other uh, way to do that. Well, why do we care? So one OSIRIS-REx science team meeting, um, you know, a lot of our colleagues that are working on this mission come from Mars, uh, the Mars community. And the Mars community, you know, you, you create a map, you project a flat map, and you do your geological interpretation on the flat map. So it was my job to get up there and explain to them that, you know, these small asteroids, they don't really work very well that way. You know, the, there's a lot of distortions in the maps, and it's very hard to interpret the geology um, without the shape. And this just gives you um, an, an illustration of that. So if you were to just look at this shape and, and you were to think about it like we're used to thinking about things on Earth, you'd say, OK, you know the low parts of the asteroid are probably here in the mid-latitudes. You've got this high part up here and this equatorial bulge. These represent the, the largest uh, diameters of the asteroid. Um, but that wouldn't be correct because you don't get ponding here in the mid-latitudes. What you, in effect, get is mobility of material down to the equator. And the equator, this bulge, is actually the low point on the asteroid. So why is that? It's because the asteroid's rotating. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you look at the energy of some particle here, you'll find that the um, centripetal acceleration it needs to, to stay on the surface of the asteroid is almost equal to the gravity there. So 
um, we probably have mobility of material down to the, to the equator here, and that's really the reason why we have the equatorial bulge. So <clears throat> the high point and the low point, and you know, if you're trying to understand how things move around and how things got there and you don't have this shape, it's a challenge. If you don't have the shape, you can't even properly um, you know, account for the, the, the gravitational, the rotational effects of, uh, of the asteroid on these particles to really even derive the elevation. So, so here's elevation. Again, the blues are the low. The reds are the high. It's kind of counterintuitive. One of my students working on Itakawa said, these, he was thinking about you know, what would it be like. Itakawa is the asteroid the Japanese mission Hayabusa went to. What would it be like to walk on one of these? You know, you're walking away from the center, but you're walking down. It's, it's, they're very strange places. Um, OK, I think we talked a little bit about maps. I, I just wanted to end with this uh, image. So this is one of the first images we got uh, after launch. So this is an image from space of the sample return capsule. So we're, we're well and truly on our way. Um, the Canadian activity, although it never seems to stop, and many people said, oh, once it launches, won't it get easier? And it just seems to keep ramping up and ramping up because uh, we have checkouts of the instrument. We, we're still uh, refining our data analysis um, software. There's still lots and lots of work to do. But when we get to uh, the fall of 2018, we'll be turning this thing on and starting the, the part we've all worked on since 2008 or, or before. So happy to be here to share the work of lots and lots of people. Um, there are literally. There's probably 100 people in Canada that have touched this thing, and there's hundreds in the US and, and a handful around other countries as well. So um, kind of privileged to be the, the spokesperson and one of the major beneficiaries here. But uh, I really couldn't do it with a, a large team. Um, in Canada in particular, you saw my colleagues. The, there's a Canadian Space Ag Agency and uh, MDA and OPTEC in particular. Thank you. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, we do have time for some more uh, some questions from the audience. So uh, we'll turn over on this side. <laughs> Are you streaming this time? Are you not streaming? Just trying to push it. So, all the information we have suggests this thing is a pile of rubble. So, Itakawa is a pile of rubble. So, you know, in essence, we may be sampling. It's, it's a little bit unclear how these things evolve in terms of rubble piles and how things move around over long periods of time when the asteroid is subjected to gravitational forces. Um, so, we will get only surface sample. Uh, it'll be up to further analysis to figure out you know, whether that's representative of a full bulk or whether it's really uh, predominantly a surface sample that's been changed due to space weathering and other effects. So it's not a direct answer. There is no direct answer right now. <laughs> I, just like, um, I know it's a short time astronomical but you know, is there a possibility that it could be impacted by some other uh, object before you get there that would disrupt the, uh, the whole experiment? Uh, I think the chances of something that would disrupt the experiment, the answer is no. Um, you know, asteroids are, are over geological time scales, are, are impacted by things, and you know, we look for, for craters on, on these things. There's some pretty small objects that aren't detected. Yeah. Um, I think the chance, you know, it's not likely. When, when we get to the end, we'll be looking for a history of impacts. Um, the problem is that because these things, you know, the surface regolith is mobile, uh, we tend to steer their, their collisional history uh, quite quickly. Yeah, well, obviously, I have to ask you about the source of the 
But the other thing more important to me, that's an interesting question, is this. Um, there, there have been many space missions, the competition is just a tool. Um, now, how many missions have there been to the as different asteroids? And who's um, um, more I guess, the service mission? Uh, and would you like to uh, contrast, compare and contrast this with any other missions? Well, the closest. Uh, uh, all right, so let's start with that one. So um, this was a this was a contest. So uh, a student uh, wanted to write the name of the asteroid. So the student thought that um, actually the spacecraft, not the asteroid, looked like a something like a flamingo. You know, with the head, like a long thin leg with the body. And there's an Egyptian god, any anyway, the bird god, it looks like a flamingo. So um, anyway, that person's imagination. <laughs> um, in terms of other missions, so there's, you mentioned Rosetta to a comet, so although the, the, um, there's a blurring between asteroids and comets, um, that's a fairly different mission. Um, there's a Dawn mission that's uh, out in the main belt now looking at asteroids, but it's not a sample return mission. So the closest ones would be Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2, those are Japanese missions. So Hayabusa 1 went to the asteroid Itakawa. So it was an S-class asteroid, still an asteroid. It um, had some challenges with its sampling uh, and brought back some very few grains. I really should have the number, but you can think about a few grains of sand. And although you think that was a major failure, you'd be surprised how much they learned from just a few grains of sand. So you know, our laboratory instruments are just so much better than anything we could put on a spacecraft that it really, you know, that's an illustration of why it's important to bring, bring a sample back. And it's not just you know, what we can deploy in the lab now, but a lot of the sample will be curated and will be preserved for you know, my students and my students' students. And we'll get better and better laboratory instruments and we'll learn more over decades. So this is not a, in 2023 the mission's over. This is, you know, we're going to continue learning from this investment over, over decades. How now, well, and then the other one um, would be Hayabusa 2. Oh, but other missions too, like the Cygnus mission, the other, other asteroids. Um, so I think we're really just talking about Don, Hayabusa 1, Hayabusa 2, and you know, was that as a comet? Um, and there was the near mission to Eros. Um, someone out here can help me if I miss one, but those would be the main ones for sure. Uh, but in terms of sample return asteroids, it's really the Hayabusa 1 and Hayabusa 2, which we'll get to its asteroid in a very similar time frame to our mission. A question up in the gallery. Two part of it. First of all, what's the scope for analyzing your return to the end flight and what's the scope for making all the way back to the middle of the sun? And secondly, one of the problems with space that causes the, the expense of the risk is that Okay, so uh, the first question. So, you know, there are severe limitations to what we can do in terms of instrumentation put on spacecraft. So, you know, where that makes sense is where you are not, I think, doing a sample collection. Because if you think in terms of, at least in terms of our present risk posture over a whole sampling um, situation, you know, launch is very risky. Proximity, proximity um, operations are, you know, some risk. The sampling is really risky. And then once you've got the sample, um, I think that, the amount of risk, uh, in terms of risk benefits anyway, in terms of developing some very key instruments and all of the handling that has to go on to really get the kind of analysis that we can do in the laboratory, it's much riskier, much more costly to, to do that than it is to actually, once you've got the sample, you know, deliver it back um, to Earth. So I think we're always going to be in a situation where laboratory instrumentation is <coughs> is 
10 or 100 times better than anything you can put on a spacecraft. And, and it's not just that, there's, there's uh, the number of instruments to be putting in there. So I, when I teach space engineering or space science to my students, I try and uh, make it clear that the way we think about operating an instrument in space is very different than in the lab. So if I want to do something in the lab, I will bring three instruments. If I want to do something in space, I'll take this one instrument and I'll, I will push it to you know, the ends of its capability and maybe a little bit further because I don't have the mass power volume or money to put three instruments on a spacecraft. So we're really operating in, in, in different regimes there. Uh, I think there will be, there's no ability right now to put the same kind of fidelity instruments on space on a spacecraft. In terms of standardization, so I used to work in the space industry before I became a professor at York. Of course, we always talk about that because the NRE costs are, are so uh, large. I think the real answer to your question, we had a class of missions that were all sort of very similar in terms of their science uh, goals. And this would be um, a way to go. Um, but we really would need to be launching you know, multiple missions in close proximity because even between you know, launching the Phoenix instrument in 2007 and the Osiris Rex laser altimeter in 2016 and trying to build that same laser, you end up having problems where time marches on, companies march on, and you try and go and get that same electronic component that you flew before and they no longer make it. And, and you rapidly get into a place where you know, you're, you're trying to maintain the same capability you had before by changing three quarters of the design when you can change 100% of the design and have a better outcome. So it really has to do with um, a little bit with frequency of missions. It, all has to, it also has to do with the constraints about what kind of components we can fly because you know, the environment is challenging. So I've heard talked about many times in this career and my past career and it's very rarely you know, really successful in terms of saving money. It, it has been successful in, in rationalizing and justifying a lower risk development, um, but not in terms of killing major amounts of non-recurring engineering. Yeah, um, how come you don't leave a full on the asteroid itself? Especially since you're saying that this one, this asteroid was only discovered in 1999. So I get the feeling it's not easy to discover new asteroids. So there's a bunch of out there that probably haven't been discovered. And this way, data pro not only can you study the surface and the interior, but you can also have it as a sort of a, I don't know, a sentinel. Of, uh, a beacon? Yeah, whatever. And just, uh, well, um, a couple of reasons. We, we didn't really want to provide landing. The spacecraft has no uh, tools to actually land and stay in and anchor, so we really wanted to minimize the risk by just sort of touching and going and not, not having to get the spacecraft to the, to the surface. Um, we also needed you know, large subsystems for the spacecraft to actually get the sample back. Um, so we would have had to make a much more complicated mission to leave a portion of the spacecraft behind. And it's not clear, you know, I think the major science goal, you, the major improvement you would get about doing something like that is you could leave a beacon that would allow you to you know, track the orbit for a much longer um, timeline and maybe improve our Karakovsky and, and other predictions over longer spans than just the uh, 500 days we're going to be in here again. Um, I, I just don't think the cost benefit thing is there. Your um, statement that it'll be five seconds for the detection go, and you're hoping you get a kilogram, maybe kilograms of dust. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously more than just your standard dice and vacuum. How big is your head that's going to be actually touching? So it's like that. And we, we blow some, some hydrogen gas and we just let it go. <laughs> Wait, two kilograms of dust. Yeah, well, two, two, two kilograms is the, is the capacity, okay. uh, essentially. Um, so our testing, so um, Lockheed Martin built this uh, sampling place, and they built some um, chambers. And so we, my colleague at the University of Calgary, did some simulant for them and said, "This is maybe what 
the surface of venue would look like. And here's some different size frequency distributions of particles, so um, you, can, you can try these things out and see what you get. And Lockheed built these big containers that they could evacuate them so we would understand the impact of atmosphere. And then they put them on the bottom of the comet and got rid of the impact of gravity. And so those kind of tests suggest that a kilogram is not out of question. I don't think we'll get to two. Um, that's really the, you know, the hard limit. But a kilogram, 60 grams is pretty small. Um, in fact, if, if we measured the 60 grams in that modding, spacecraft modding, we, we would go and sample again because we have to measure something like closer to 200 grams, I forget the exact number, because the uncertainty of the measurement is something like 200 grams plus or minus 140 grams. So if we don't measure 200 grams, we'll not be sure that we have 60. <laughs> What's the it may be a little, so this is a trade-off. Uh, five seconds was the original number. Um, there are some trade-offs associated with the time of touch and the spacecraft velocity of navigation. So when we're talking about five and 15 seconds, we're not talking about a minute. Right.